skipped a couple slides that I would have normally gone over. So we were stopped right here. We were talking about secondary storage. Okay. So what we didn't have is these other slides that were from the textbook that um, there's two kinds of storage. There's primary and secondary. Secondary storage is where stuff is permanently stored. It's secondary uh, to the CPU. So when we talk about secondary storage, we're saying that's where the CPU considers secondary. And that includes all CDs, hard drives, flash drives. Uh, the CPU can't even talk to it. The motherboard has to move information from there to primary storage, which is our RAM, in order for the CPU to use it. Okay? So we already talked about one of those secondary storage devices, which was the hard drive. We already finished talking about that. The next one that we were just got to was the optical drive, and that's where we stopped last class. So it's still the same thing. It's still considered secondary storage. I'm going to switch my colors. It's secondary storage. That doesn't look like a C. I'm going to start on that. It's called secondary storage, but it's considered permanent. Okay? It's where we keep stuff. It's where our operating system is saved. It's where our programs are saved. It's where our data is saved. It can be the hard drive, but it can also be an optical drive. And when we say optical, it used to only mean CDs, but then it came to become DVDs. And now it's developed into Blu-ray players, right? Really, our stuff still is only saved on CDs and DVDs. Every drive that I know of in the district is a DVD drive, which is roughly uh, seven and a half times larger than a CD, which is why we moved from uh, CDs to DVDs, because we needed more and more and more information. Okay? Anybody here um, have a Steam account? play games, okay? If you go and buy a game on DVD at GameStop, did you actually buy the game? <coughs> no, you didn't buy the game. You bought the key to the game, basically, right? If, if any people don't know, everything's gotten bigger than a DVD can hold, okay? Windows barely fits on one DVD still. I, I assume that at some point we're not even going to fit on a DVD. Programs like uh, Elder Scrolls Online, which is one that our family plays because the boys love it. You get a DVD if you buy the game, but the first thing it does is it downloads 65 gig worth of stuff from the internet. It takes hours for that at game to install, and how many DVDs would it take if a DVD is 5.5 gigabytes, okay, in that CD? like 700 gigabytes, oh, I'm sorry, megabytes, okay? We take out, it would take many, many DVDs, so they don't do that anymore. They assume that you have, you have the internet, so they give you a, a, C, a DVD that just starts the process. And really, Windows does that too. Windows adds the basic functionality, and then it tries to go online and update everything else, okay? So these storage devices, for many things, are just the start of the information we need anymore because how big things have gotten, most of those things are out on the internet anymore. Okay? <coughs> so the optical drive is one of our storage devices that we have that's a permanent, permanent secondary storage device. The last one is a um, flash drive, really. And you can't even talk about sizes of flash drives because they can be enormous to very, very small. The first flash drives we gave out here, we it used to be part of your fees and in computer one you got a 128 meg flash drive and then we got up to I think we we're giving away four gig flash drives and then it was like why are we even doing flash drives anymore because we've got the mobile H drive there's really no reason to do it you can get to all your stuff if you got the internet at home if not you can save it to your laptop and take it home with you so we don't use that much anymore but you can do everything to boot off a flash drive just like you can off of a <coughs> off of a PC this flash drive has a version of the Chrome OS on it, which you can boot to, and then when you boot to it, you can install Chrome on like this netbook. And you can use to install Chrome. Do you guys know what the difference is between Chrome OS and Chrome the browser? It's an operating system. Yeah, it's actually an operating system that just brings you to Chrome browser. Okay, so you can you can literally take the worst system in the world and put Chrome on it if it'll work on it. 
Okay, and this one has worked on almost everything. Uh, and get to the internet on it. As long as, this can, as long as it works when you install it, like this one does, these, these drives on these particular computers only have 16 gig flash drives. I can't install Windows on these anymore. It's impossible. But I can install Chrome on it. See the little Chrome guy picture I have there? I can install Chrome on it and then do what we need to do as far as getting on a browser. Now, that's all you can do. So all it does is it comes to Chrome. You got the Chrome OS, and you can go to Chrome, and that's, that's the extent of it. You can add your Chrome apps and stuff on it, but it's all these do anymore, but they boot in like 40 seconds, which is great compared to the five minutes it was taking for them to boot into Windows. Right? I'm going to wait for five minutes. If you're a teacher, just to get the browser, would you rather have it just open up in Chrome? Okay? So Chrome OS is an operating system. Okay? that you can install. Uh, this, this install is free. You can download it, make a flash drive, so you can boot off a flash drive. This will just run off the flash drive, too. If I had this one set to boot up a flash drive and had this in here, we just boot the Chrome OS right off the flash drive, and, and it would work fine. So all these other kinds of permanent storage can replace a hard drive. They don't have to be a hard drive or this. You can boot off this. You can have a computer with no hard drive whatsoever, and just have a flash drive plugged into it, have a boot to Chrome. Or in the case of this one, uh, I got this one set to boot from the CD-ROM, and I've got a CD-ROM in there that's got an operating system on it, and it can boot from that operating system too. There are schools that have whole labs with no hard drives. All they have is a little mini flash drive in the back that boots the Chrome OS. What can Jesse do wrong? Can't do anything wrong. Because as soon as I reboot it, it's a new computer because it just booted to a read-only device. No matter what he does, he can install a virus because all it really does is install it in memory, and as soon as I reboot, it's gone, which is why some schools do that. Plus, this flash drive is really fast. Plus, it's not saving anything on it. It's saving it to the cloud because you're just on the Chrome browser and you never touch anything. So if I was trying to do something where I never had to maintain anything, I can just buy a whole bunch of little 4 gig flash drives, install that to it, and just have everything boot to the flash drive. And I would never have to maintain anything, other than you guys stealing my flash drives. Which would happen, right? If I had a whole lab full of flash drives in the back, what would happen in the middle school? Eventually, somebody go, oh, I can just take this home. Yeah, you can. And then it's gone, right? So unless I go and use JB Weld and JB Weld in the back. So this just booted to an operating system called the Ultimate Boot CD. Off the, off the CD-ROM, because that was set to boot before this. If I change the boot order, it'll boot to that next. And we're going to get to that here later on today. I set down my pen. Oh, there it is. So this is one other kind of secondary storage. And all those kinds of secondary storage, hard drive, CD-ROM, flash drive, we can put operating systems on, we can put programs on, we can do everything from all of those. It's just some of them are not writable. This one, if you boot it from, you can't write to it if you're booting from. This one actually could. Flash drive obviously is writable as well. <coughs> so, secondary storage or storage devices can be temporary in the RAM or permanent, like our hard drives and our CD ROMs or our flash drive. Okay. So, by the way, did I define the term RAM? What does RAM stand for? Random access memory. I don't know if I, the first plot box said I never defined it. Okay, so it stands for random access me memory. It's readable, it's writable, and it's volatile. I, said, I think I said that volatile, meaning that if you lose power, it's gone. Look, RAM is empty. It has to be held by power. And in fact, our memory in our computer is refreshed thousands of times a second to keep the information in. Thousands of times a second it's refreshed. If you interrupt power on a computer, you can lose information very quickly, which is why important computers have battery backup so they don't even get momentary lapses of power. Okay, so the CPU uses temporary storage, also called primary storage, to hold data and instructions while it's processed. When data instructions are not being used by the CPU, they're kept in permanent storage or secondary storage. Okay, terms that are definitely on them. And I used a, a little a example like that run around the room uh, on the difference between primary storage to the CPU and secondary storage as far as how the CPU processes it. Okay? It's just a picture depicting the same thing. Okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about is 
is called interface or expansion cards. And I always use the term expansion. They're referred to as interface cards. They expand the capabilities of the motherboard. Okay? Interface or expansion cards expand the capabilities of the motherboard. When you buy a motherboard, it has certain things it can do, and it can't do anything else. You can't add things to a motherboard, but you can expand the capability of your systems by plugging new stuff into the motherboard. Do you ever plug the power in on that thing? No, I told you there wasn't any ports available. And I wasn't unplugging oh, There is two. Yeah, it's all the way back there. It's all the way back there. So my getting on the ground is somehow better than your getting on the ground. Oh, it doesn't reach all the way over there anymore. Told you. Here. I'm here. It was down here, Gwen. Because this is where it used to be. I don't know how it got moved down. There, just for you, Jesse. Oh, and your pencil. Yeah, I got mauled by that manual one. No, no promises on that one either. Yeah, it could just, it could just be typing the... Oh, I can't type it in. Okay, so expansion cards are mounted in the expansion slots in the motherboard, which is all these slots over here to the left on this picture, okay? These slots here, and there's one, two, three, four, five on this one. This one only has three... One, two, three. These expand the capabilities in the motherboard with cards that we put into it. Okay, and those cards, those expansion cards, all the information, all the technology is embedded on the card. All the information on how to communicate with the motherboard is embedded on the card. It's part of the card. Okay, so when the card gets plugged in to the motherboard. The reason they're called plug and play means you can plug it in, turn on your computer, and normally just go. Because all the information is stored on the card for the motherboard to figure out what it is and how to use it. So this is a expansion card that's a video card, which is the most common expansion card here at Trail and in most people's computers. Just because it has integrated video doesn't mean it's good video. This video on here stinks. It'll work. It'll open up your browser and you see your browser and stuff just fine. But try to put Minecraft on this one and it's not going to work. Minecraft in a big, huge user video. It requires a secondary, a good video card or an expansion video card that all you do is line it up with your system and push that sucker down and plug it in with it off and unplugged and grounded. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then turn it back on and the computer's going to find that provided it's plugged in all the way and seated right, and be able to use that new video capability that I've just expanded on the motherboard. Okay. Uh, it says port configuration can identify the card function. What that means is these ports have are already told. The motherboard knows that that is the primary video card slot. And in some cases, there's two, three, or four <coughs> video cards. But that's the boss video card slot. It already knows that. And your motherboard man man manual would say, put your video card in here, even though it might fit three other places. Okay, That's all that's saying right there, is that the, sometimes the manual or the motherboard itself is already pre-configured to do certain things. We talked about, when we were looking at plugging stuff in, that these are those integrated things on the motherboard. And then perpendicular to that are the expansion stuff, depending on which way the computer is sitting. These expansion slots take precedence over those integrated ones. So the ones up here, which I can't see on this picture, these are less important than these. If it's plugged in down here, it means use it. Can't plug the, If I had this in just like this on this computer, and I plug video in right here instead of right there, it's not going to work. Because the motherboard already will sense this video card and say, ah, you're boss now, and just turn this one off. Okay, so in expansion stuff takes priority over the other stuff. 
Biggest one I already said is video cards. We do a whole chapter seven is all on expansion cards. And we talk more and more on video cards, how to select video cards, the difference between video cards. The difference between these two video cards are ginormous, okay? This one gives me a basic analog video out of that port. This one gives me three, two digital, one analog out. It's got its own cooling fan. It's got its own memory. It's got a super processor on there. This one at the time pro probably cost around $400. You can spend $3,000 on a video card. Okay, You can spend more on a video card than you do on the entire rest of the system, depending on the system that you've done. So this is usually the most expensive extra part that you add on your computer, Okay, depending on what you're doing with the computer. If you're a gamer, you do better off buying a better video card, spending more on your video card than you do on your processor because that's what it's using more intensely is a video card over the processor. So, and we'll talk about choosing those parts and stuff as we go further in the course. We also have other expansion cards that we can add, like a network interface card. We used to have a lot of these in the district because our expansion cards were better than the integrated ones on the motherboard. That is not true anymore. Every integrated mother motherboard, it used to be they all came with 100 and we would add a thousand, which is also one gigabit cards, but now all the computers we have come with one gig cards in them. So very seldom do we have to add another card on anything. Our servers we do, but not very often on any, any PC do we add a second one. Uh, there used to be a second one like on Cindy's computer so she could talk to the sign because each one of these can be on a different network. So my, my, both mine back there have two, one that's talking on the high school network and one that's talking on the, the main network so that I can talk to servers on one and use LAN school to watch your laptops on another one if I need to, okay? So they can <coughs> physically talk to different networks, but realistically, most of the ones at school only have one card in there, one, most of the user ones. But if you guys have something at home, let's say you've got, you don't have, say you've got two PCs at home, but you've got no Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is not that expensive anymore, but if you put an extra card in your computer, you could actually run it right from here to the secondary computer and share the internet. You don't need Wi-Fi. You could just have two network cards and everything, have the internet daisy chaining through the computers and sharing the network uh, connection that way as well, which would get you better connectivity on those machines because wired, no matter what anybody ever tries to sell you, wired is always better than Wi-Fi. I have the best Wi-Fi in my house which is the same as the, not exactly the same model, but it's AC, which is the fastest Wi-Fi wi they make. My son has an AC card, and he was getting six meg, and my wired one gets 80. So I wired him up, and now he gets 82. And he's like, oh, I don't like your mine. Mine's not as fast as yours, which only mattered when we were playing games together, and I always beat him because he was lagging, and I, I liked that. That was okay. Anyway, so... So wired is always better than wireless, always better than wireless. And places try to sell that wired, wireless is just as fast, hooey, that is not true. Anyway, so that's another thing that we can do with the uh, interface card, okay? The last thing we, that we need to talk about is the electrical system itself, which is also, consequently, the first part we actually talk about in the class, okay? It has, a, we have an electrical system, and an electrical system turns it from 110 volt wall power, which is alternating current. I don't know why this says this. It's 110 AC, and it turns it to direct current. And we'll talk in chapter three about the difference between alternating and direct current, why it matters. You just need to know that it turns wall power to usable electrical power for electrical components. and. Most electrical components are on direct current. Okay, your phone's direct current, these laptops are direct current, calculators direct current, uh, and why we'll talk about later. Okay, it also has a fan that keeps it at 185 degrees Fahrenheit, which I guarantee is on the test. It's the temperature at which all electrical components fail. Okay, above 185 degrees Fahrenheit, electrical components fail. 80, 185 degrees Fahrenheit, electrical components fail. My hard drives used to fail all the time in the main closet because the closet was so darn hot. And the inside of the computers were even hotter, and then they would just fail. So the 
one of the things the power supply does is help circulate air out of our computer. In, in many computers, it's the only fan that pulls air out of the computer. In decently made computers, it's not the only fan, okay? But if you buy a cheap one on, online or go to Walmart, that may be the only fan in your computer. Fans cost less than $10. It behooves you to put a secondary one in there to help pull the air out of your computer because the cooler your computer runs, the better and faster your computer will run as well. And it will help keep things from failing. And we're going to watch that video I talked about last class in a couple minutes. And what happens when it gets too hot? And you'll see the CPU blow up and stuff as well. Okay. So it does that. It has a bunch of different plugs on it. And the type of power supply we purchase determines the kind of things we can put in it. Every power supply is not created equal. Some of them put out way more power. And you can put four video cards in a system. Some of them wouldn't power a single video card in the system. Most of these computers that we have have bare bones power. You start adding too much, and all of a sudden they get wonky because they can't push all the rest of the things. And they have to have enough power. It's not just about the number of plugs. It's about how much it can push out. We'll learn about that in ch chapter three as well. We'll learn about what all these different plugs do and what they all plug into um, as part of chapter three. You just need to know that they have to have power. Everything, everything connected to the computer gets powered just like it's connected to the motherboard. Some things get powered. This is the motherboard plug right here. Some things get power directly from the motherboard. They just, everything the USB is just plugged into the USB uh, port. And that USB, this light right here is lit up because it's got power from the USB from the motherboard. Okay, So the power comes from here, goes through here, goes in there, goes to the motherboard, and then power comes out through the motherboard. Some things are plugged directly in here because they require more power. Hard drives spinning at 7,000 revolutions per minute have a motor that's always going require their own power. CD-ROMs, hard drives all have their own power. Almost everything else goes through the motherboard and get power from the power, power supply. This isn't plugged in. Does this have power? Yeah, of course it does. It can't work. If it doesn't have power, it's got batteries in the back. And it talks wirelessly to this doggle over here that has power from the motherboard and lets it work. Okay? Everything that we use that's connected to the computer has to get power or it's not running in some way, shape, or form, okay? And we'll learn what the plugs are. That's the plug that goes into the motherboard and what all those different wattages are and stuff in chapter three. So we've gone over all the hardware, but I'm gonna re rewind to get the slides that I didn't have on this one because I grabbed the wrong power one in the beginning before we continue on with this. So let me rewind a little bit. There's not really any additional information, I don't think, but I wanna make sure I didn't skip anything and I grabbed the wrong one, okay? I think I already defined this, that hardware is the physical stuff inside the case. The software is the data instructions that get run by the hardware. Software uses hardware for input, processing, and output, okay? I don't know if I use those exact terms, but I, I wanna make sure I got through everything the first time and didn't skip anything. I don't know how I grabbed the wrong, wrong notebook, the one that I had not edited when I started last class. Okay, so I don't think there's anything new there. Obviously, I'm recording this as well if you need to look at it either, okay? I already said this stuff. I said what the input and output things are. Primary input is the keyboard and mouse, and I said you needed to know the colors of the PS2 plugs with the color of the keyboard. What? What? Keyboard is? Okay, the two choices are purple and green. Keyboard is? Keyboard's purple. Mouse is green on a PS2 plug. That's the round one with the six pins, okay? Still have those on computers, so that's still a testable question, okay? My two primary inputs, keyboard and mouse. My outputs are a monitor and a printer, and I know this is old picture. No CRT monitors anymore in our district. When I got here, there was tons. The processor talks to RAM, which is its primary but temporary storage, and permanent devices, which are, are its secondary storage. We just talked about that just a second ago. Okay. Hardware is used for input and output. Hardware is physical things inside the case, which includes the motherboard. I didn't mention the chipset. We're going to talk about that in just a second. It has the CPU, which is where most processing takes place. 
Uh, also has our storage devices and any other devices that communicate through the motherboard. Okay. We also have our expansion cards and our electrical system. Okay. Everything that talks talks through the motherboard to the CPU. That's how everything happens. And we're going to talk about those motherboard configuration settings in just a minute when we talk about the boot process and the things that are done there. Again, I already said this, input, keyboard, mouse, output, monitor, and printer. Inside, motherboard is the primary circuit. It houses the CPU, the memory, and the other components all connect to it. I already said this as well. We've got a flash drive, hard drive, CD-ROMs that are for our storage. We've got a power supply in there as well. And everything else connects through cables or other boards to those things as well. It's just a picture showing the inside of a computer. We look at them just like this. Uh, this one just shows the myriad of wires that can be on inside of your computer connecting everything up to the motherboard. And we looked at this picture as well. Let me get to the next slide. This one's a different picture, but it just is to show you, if you remember we talk about the form factor is ATX. And in ATX form factor, we have our integrated, we have our CPU, and we have our memory all in a line. And then all of our expansion stuff is off to the side. This can be very large. If it's full size, it can end right here if it's micro. But it's all ATX because it's all defined by the same basic structure of the motherboard. So we've got our integrated stuff. We talked about that extensively when we were talking about how to plug stuff into our computer and the different plugs that we can have uh, in the back of our computer. We went through all those on day one. Okay, so this is the one thing that I didn't cover was the chipset. So the motherboard houses the CPU. Everything connects to the CPU through the motherboard itself. And then we have, oh, and it all terminates at the, the uh, underside of the CPU, all the, what they're called buses, terminate the CPU, and I'm trying to find that one slide that I'm talking about. It must be after the CPU. Okay. So we've got a CPU, but we also have a chipset, and the chipset controls the flow of information to the CPU. Okay? And we've got two chipsets to control information coming and going to the CPU, because it doesn't, everybody just doesn't get to talk at one time. The chipset says who's talking to the CPU when, because it wouldn't be able to handle the flow otherwise. So what we've got on there is we've got two chipsets, a north chipset and a south chipset, okay? Also called the north bridge and the south bridge. When I look at a motherboard, take this video card out, sorry. When I look at a motherboard, every motherboard has two big chips on it. The one under a heat sink is always the north one because it does more work than everything else. The other one is always the south one. In this case, I've got a heat sink on the north and nothing on the south. And on this one, I've got a big heat sink on the north and a little tiny heat sink on the south. The newer ones have heat sinks on the south too, but there's all, they're always smaller. Why? Because the north bridge and the north chipset controls the flow of information to the CPU from RAM and video only. And it's the busiest thing that it's doing. Okay? The C we already know the CPU only talks to the memory, so it all goes through that chipset right there. And same thing with the video, which also is the closest one. Actually, this one is that's the video. It also goes to the video. So all this information is going through there. And it's ma managed by that. Every other bit of information is going through the south chi chip chipset from your mouse, your keyboard, your um, scanner, your hard drive, your CD-ROM. Every other bit of information goes through the south, and it's minuscule, minuscule in the amount of information compared to what it's talking to when it comes to the memory and the video. And that's why the north bridge is always got a heat sink on it. And I did not mention the chipset when we talked about this last time. Questions on chipset. North, south, north, video and RAM, south, everything else. North, busy, 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 south, eh, not so busy. Okay? And that's the intro we're going to talk more about in chapter four when we talk about uh, motherboards in general, but that's the intro to what the chipsets are. Okay. So, we talked about this. Primary storage is random access memory or RAM. It's also volatile, it goes away as soon as power is turned off. RAM 
goes away as soon as power turns off. Ram goes away as soon as power is turned off. I said that enough times, there'll be a matching question that sounds just like that. Which one of these goes away when power is turned off? It's rain, okay? Uh, and this is just a picture of that, and this is a picture of all the different kinds of rain. There's different, the small ones go in laptops, the big ones go in desktops. Uh, in fact, the current desktop RAM and laptop RAM isn't even on this picture because it's really too old to have all of them on there, but it's got a bunch of them. And we'll talk more about that in Chapter 5 when we get to RAM. And I think that's it of what I missed. There's just a couple slides I didn't have on there. I didn't mention the chipset, and I didn't mention the 185-degree thing. Okay? That's all. That was all supposed to be day one, when you fit in day one anyways. Okay? So that was our first class objective. Our second class objective, if I can get back there and be easier if I use the arrow button a little bit. Okay. We know these are our, these are our hardware components that we just talked about. Our software we talked about as well that we've got an operating system and we've got programs. We did not talk about the very first piece of software your computer boots to. And that's what today we're going to talk about is the whole boot process, and that's called BIOS. Okay, BIOS runs first, then the operating system. We're going to talk about how a computer boots, which is the objective of today, is understanding the PC boot process. Okay, why? First of all, is it important to understand what it's doing when it boots? Why does it matter? Okay. Yeah, okay. All that together, I'm going to say yes. Uh, and, and what Jesse said is so we can understand what's going on and understand the diagnostics. Okay? If we don't understand what's happening when it boots, we're not going to understand what's broken. If we're at Windows, we've already missed a whole bunch of spots we had to see what's going on. And if we're at Windows, we already know a bunch of things already working, right? Is the CPU working if I get to Windows? Yeah. Okay, is the power supply working if we get to Windows? Most likely, unless we're at Windows for three or four minutes and then it shuts down, and maybe it's not, okay? But there are things that are getting checked early. So we need to know these terms. We need to know what happens when it boots, okay? So I'm put my pen down. So we're going to talk about the boot process. What's the first thing that happens when we get a turn on a computer? What do we do first? We press the... Okay, so did I turn it off? Yes. Okay, so what happens when we press the power button? Stuff happens, and it happens really, really fast, okay? We press the power button, and the first thing that happens when I push that is the signal goes to, I'm going to write PSU, to the power supply unit, okay? As soon as I push that, the signal goes straight to the power supply. I don't know where I sit down my power supply. I'm walking around, okay. Okay, so the first thing that happens, I push that button, and a signal goes to here, and it says, paraphrasing, I'd like to turn on. How do you feel about that? Okay? And the power supply has to send a signal back that says, I have good power. If it doesn't send a signal back that says it has good power, the process ends right there. Okay? So the very first thing is it checks for good power. Now, this is a very basic check. It can say, I feel good about starting and then die 45 seconds later. Okay, if this power supply is going out and you're running your computer and it, it, it runs at home for five, maybe 10 minutes and then the computer shuts down every single time, it's always running for five or 10 minutes and then it shuts down. Well, I'm gonna tell you it's probably this, okay? Because the fan's clogged doesn't work, it's not cooling off, it gets too hot, and it just, it just turns off. It happens all the time. Okay? You're going to learn in Chapter 3 the easiest way to diagnose a uh, power supply is to put your hand on the outside of the computer. Do you feel a nice flow of air? And if you say no, then it needs, it needs to go. Okay? So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to check for good power. If it gets a signal that it's got good power, then it's there's a signal sent to the motherboard to start. Okay? 
Motherboard doesn't just start though, it's going to send a signal to the motherboard and say, okay, go ahead and start. So that happens in a, in a millisecond when I push this power supply. And the motherboard then starts the clock. Okay, what's the clock? There's a clock on the motherboard that I'm gonna, we're going to say it's ticking. And the speed that it's ticking at is the speed that information goes around the motherboard. For instance, this motherboard ticks at 800 megahertz. How many times a second does it tick? You want to remember last class? How many? 800 million. Okay. Times a second. It's clicking 800 million times a second. It's saying that's the speed that all information will move around this motherboard. If Mr. Teslog said, everybody take everybody home on the buses and don't look for other buses, go whatever speed you want to. We have collisions, right? Because if I decide I want to go 65 and be done with because I'm getting paid the same amount on this bus route, no matter how fast I get it done, and Jesse's like, well, I'm a temporary bus driver, so I'm only getting paid per hour, and so Jesse's doing 35 and I need to slam right into Jesse, right? Everybody has to go the same speed as we pull out of the lot. Same thing happens on a computer. The motherboard starts a clock, and it says, we're all going at this speed. Everybody got that. So now all information moves around the motherboard at the same speed. Okay, it starts the clock. It initializes the CPU saying, hey, wake up. We're getting ready to go. Okay. And then it loads BIOS. Our first program. Basically, it said everybody's on, everybody's got power now, load the BIOS. Okay, what does BIOS stand for? BIOS is the basic, I didn't make this up, input output system. Okay, we know that the purpose of the computer is to take in inputs and give out outputs, so the first program is called the basic input output system. Okay. It is a program that lives in ROM. Anybody know what ROM stands for? Read-only memory. Okay. In other words, you can only read from there. Read-only memory. This is important because it's a test question, which isn't the only reason it's important. But it's on a chip on the motherboard and can't go away. No matter what happens to power or anything else, the basic input output system is written permanently to a chip, a read-only memory chip. It's either referred to as CMOS ROM or BIOS ROM, depending on the text that you're looking at. Okay, Is where BIOS is stored. It's a program that starts up. When you see the word Dell, on this computer, as it's starting, or the one on yours, that's BIOS loading. Okay, so the basic input system loads and it runs. The first thing it does is it runs the POST. Okay, and POST stands for Power On Self Test. It runs around the motherboard and talks to every single port on the motherboard. It talks to the memory. It talks to the CPU. It talks to every hard drive port, every, every um, USB port, everything. And it says, are you there? Who's there? And it gets an inventory. It gets a hardware inventory. And it gets a code back if the hardware is not good. Now, this is very basic. Memory errors that you get back during the post are like, memory's not here. And it will start going beep, beep, beep. In fact, here, we'll do it to this one over here. I didn't do it this morning, but uh, I wasn't thinking that this one was open. Okay? So if I yank the memory out of this one, oh, there's four sticks. I don't want to yank all four sticks out. We'll do it next time. All the computers that were open it up. It will start beeping at us. And we get what are called beep codes. And the codes are different on the power on self test, depending on the motherboard and what we hear and what's wrong. So sometimes the beep will just be like beep and won't go away until you pull the power. Sometimes it will be four beeps. It's all the codes are different. In the case of these Dells, not only do they have beep codes, but they have four numbers on here, and the numbers that are lit up give you an indication of what's wrong on the power on self test too. So it does this power on self test to get this inventory and do a basic is everybody working? 
Okay, and then it loads the boot order from CMOS RAM. Okay, there is a RAM chip on here. It's RAM. What is what does RAM do when you lose power? It goes away. RAM is only held by power, okay? And this CROM RAM holds the configuration, including time and boot order. If you ever start a computer and it says, it says take date and time not set, press F1 to continue. Has anybody ever seen that before? Nope, no one's ever seen that? Okay, it's the worst message ever. Because really, it doesn't mean the date and time aren't set. It should say, I lost my configuration, check your system, or something like that. Because that's what it's saying. When it says date and time not set, really, it went back to 1999, which it knows it's not supposed to be 1999. No one owns a time shift, right? So it's saying something went wrong. Now, if this goes away when power is lost, why does the power, why do I not lose the time every time I restart my computer? Is there any power on this motherboard right now? Anyone want to try a yes nod and tell me why there is power on this motherboard right now? There's a battery right there. Okay, that's called the CMOS battery. And that battery only lives to hold this information on CMOS RAM. That's all it does. If that battery gets pulled, it loses the take, date and time, it loses the configuration, it loses the boot order. It makes your computer, computer boot slower because now it has to recheck the configuration of everything because the RAM, CMOS RAM is empty. So that's every computer has one. Every single computer has a battery on, on the motherboard. And that's all that battery does. So if you ever see date and time not set or some weird error like that, it means this battery is dead. And it would be better if the error said, your battery's dead. Because that's really what I meant. Okay? It's a stupid error message. There's a ton of stupid error messages that, that you'll see in computers that don't make any sense. So, it loads the boot order for off, off the CMOS RAM, which holds the configuration and the time of the boot order by that battery. Who sets that boot order? You do. We do. Set by humans, okay? We have to go in and say what order we want this computer to boot from. What's more important in this computer right now, where do I want it to find? And the boot order is the order of OS search. I think I spelled search. We'll pretend that I spelled search, OK? It's the order that it's going to look for the operating system and go to boot, OK? This, this drive has Chromium on it. This drive has. Um, Ultimate Boot CD Linux OS on it. The drive inside has Windows on it. Who do I check first? And that's all, that's all that boot order is. And I get there, in the case of Dell's, by hitting F2. I get, is how I get into BIOS. And there's a BIOS screen on the quiz you're going to take today. It looks nothing like this BIOS screen. Oh, by the way, it says F2 to enter setup. And now it says preparing to enter setup. And that is the BIOS setup screen that I can use to set the date and time, to set what things it can boot from, to say the order that it boots from, and we choose that. And there's some different boot orders we use here at Trail, okay? So your laptops right now, there's five different things we could choose. There's only two that are checked, and your laptops go like this. There's the only two things that are allowed to boot from, okay? And if I go down here to boot sequence, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six different things I could check on this machine. There's only three that are checked. And over here on this side is the order that they're booted from. I'm going to add USB device. And I'm going to move it up one. OK. So it's now it's going to look here to boot. And then it's going to look to the CD to boot. And then it's going to look to the network to boot. And finally, it's going to look to the hard drive to boot. And when it goes to the, this boot order, it's going to go, can I boot from you? And the answer is yes or no. It either finds an operating system right away or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it goes to the next one. Why are you guys set 
to this order. It's in this particular order so that it boots as fast as it possibly can be. If you put hard drive first and you have a good hard drive, it's going to boot like that. It's not going to go anywhere else. If I had Nick first, then it's going to sit there looking for through the network for an operating system. Is there an operating system? Is there? And then it finds it. It'll find it. Fog. And then Fog will say, I don't want you. Go to the hard drive. So it's going to add 10 seconds every single time you start if I just reverse that order. And some people's are set wrong. Sometimes they come in here and I'm like, ah, whoever, whatever student set them, didn't set them in the right order. So your computer may take 10 seconds longer to boot than his because of that right there. Okay. Now desktops, all the desktops are set like this. That's how all the desktops and trailer are set. And they're set that way so that if you walk in with the CD-ROM and drop it in the drive, it'll use it. And if you don't, it'll go to the network. Do I care about the 10 seconds? No, because I have them all auto start before the teachers come in anyway. Okay? Because if I force it to put on a new version of Firefox or a new version of Chrome or a new version of Flash, I want it to happen before they even step in the building. I want them to walk in to their Windows screen and not even know that I just did a bunch of stuff while they weren't looking. And that's why I have it auto start. And the last thing it does is go to the hard drive. And the reason it goes to the NIC first is because if I want to wipe your whole computer, I could do it before you even get to work, and it'll come up with a fresh load of Windows. That's why theirs is set that order. And the yours is set this order for speed. Theirs is set this order for convenience. Your convenience, my convenience, they don't know the difference because it all that starts anyway. Okay, I gotta hit when I make these changes, all I have to do is I have to hit apply for it to count. So I hit apply, and then I exit. And now it's going to do a soft boot. It's going to go through, do the power on self test again. It's going to load BIOS. And then BIOS is going to say, where are the operating systems? And we'll look for them in that order. And if this works, I should boot up to Chromium. Sometimes USB drives don't always work. But what do you want them to? We'll see what happens and see whether it boots up to Chromium this time. There's no light on the USB drive, so I'm not going to know until I start to see it over there. At home, if you guys leave your computer off all the time at home, you really want to make your hard drive be first so that it boots faster. Right? I mean, especially if you've got an old spinny drive, which has taken two minutes to start, save yourself the 10 seconds by making the first thing in the boot order. The only reason you need to change it is if you have a reason to. Okay? To get into BIOS, and it's trying, it's trying to load it right now. To get into BIOS, there's a, I forgot to mention this first block. Okay, there's three main keys to get into BIOS, okay? It's either the delete key, the F1 key, or the F2 key. And in the case of here at Trail, it's almost always the F2 key because Dell always uses the F2 key. So a lot of times when I'm sitting here, if I don't know what it is, I'll sit here and hit delete F1, F2, delete F1, F2, when I'm trying to get into BIOS because I don't know which one it is. If it's a Dell, it's always F2. And for some reason, I don't put this down here because we have almost none of them. Some HPs are F10. Why couldn't they say, why, why can't we all get along? I don't know why they're not all the same key to get into BIOS, okay? But you need to know how to get into BIOS because the first thing we do in troubleshooting is we go into BIOS and we say, let's see, we're up here. So now I'm booted to this operating system right on here. come right up in Chrome and the only thing you do on a Chrome desktop is do Chrome but it's going to be in Chrome here in just a second okay so you could do them just like that and and no one has to reboot this computer you just log off and somebody else can log on to Chrome and log off and somebody else can log on to Chrome so if you've got an old laptop you've got an old desktop that that's all you're trying to do is get to the internet then I've got to pick my picture I made my little Chrome oh being too fast. So those are how we get into, into BIOS. BIOS lets us set all kinds of things. 
auto starting in the day. What happens if I unplug the power and just plug it back in? Does it start? Does it stay off? Most of our PCs are set to stay off because the power is going on and off. The last thing I want is the PC to try to turn back on. Well, it's going like this, right? Just leave, leave yourself off until I tell you to turn back on. Servers are always set to turn immediately back on because if you come into school, there was a power outage last night. No one would be able to log on until Mr. Pool ran around and started servers up. So those are set differently. Set the boot order in there. You set the time and date. Is the NIC on? Is the NIC off? Does sound work? Does sound not work? You can turn on and off all kinds of things in BIOS. And we'll play with BIOS a little bit. You guys will all do them on um, the HP laptops that we're going to be working with in Chapter 2 a little bit more. Okay, so I, I didn't finish. I didn't finish my boot order. Okay, so the next thing it does is it looks for the boot order. And then BIOS basically hands all that hardware inventory off to whatever the operating system is. It says, it's your computer now. Here's what I found. Good luck. Okay. And then the operating system tries to load that hardware. And if all the hardware loads good enough, then it finally presents you with the GUI or a graphical user interface. Okay? And then you're done. When you see Windows is up, the graphical user interface or GUI of Windows is loaded. But in the meantime, BIOS had to hand those hardware components off to the operating system. They said, Windows 10, here's what I got. And then Windows 10, when you see that window thing happening on your screen, that's what it's doing right there. It's loading hardware. And if the last thing you saw was that window and then black screen, nothing happens after that, it usually means that it failed trying to load some hardware and it died right then. Okay? Mr. Anderson re-imaged this laptop or this desktop. I want to say six, maybe seven times. And every time it would come up, it would die on that window screen, then with blue screen. You get the little window screen, blue screen shut down. You re-image it. Window screen, blue screen shut down. You try a different image. Window screen, blue screen shut down. In the end, it turned out it was the Windows drivers for this stupid Logitech keyboard that as soon as he unplugged this, the computer worked fine. He must have spent four hours on that computer. And it was all this keyboard that the drivers from Windows didn't work right. And so every time I tried to load this keyboard, the computer blue screen and shut down. And he, he was about ready to whack his head on that black table. He's like, I don't understand. Why can't I get it to work? And then he found this program that would run in the background that would tell you why it failed. And it said it failed loading the keyboard driver. He's like, no way. And he unplugged it and then it worked. So as soon as we see the GUI, though, we're up to Windows. Does that mean everything's fine? No. <clears throat> we could have it come up to Windows and last for uh, 20 minutes, and then all of a sudden blue screen. Because we have, you guys have so much memory in there. <clears throat> when we go to the new ones, they're going to be 8 gig in all of them. And you may never use that first. You may only use that first four gig of RAM, and then all of a sudden you open one more Chrome tab, and all of a sudden it needs that more memory, and all of a sudden it goes to the second memory stick, which is what's bad, and your system blue screens. And like it worked, and then all of a sudden the blue screen is shut down. Well, maybe it's because one stick's good and one stick's bad. Because that basic check doesn't say, are you a good stick of RAM? It just says, are you a stick of RAM? And it says, yes, I'm a stick of RAM. And then it goes on its merry way. It's too fast for it to do a real check. Okay. <coughs> so that's the order of booting. All that all happens as soon as I push my button, and I get that. Um, I kind of want to play with this just to see how it runs and stuff. But anyways, I'll do that. So that's what happens during the boot order. Let's see if I uh, let me go back to my little first slide here. So okay, so we said BIOS, basic input output system. Host is a power on soft test. CMOS is where ROM and RAM are on the motherboard. It's CMOS ROM 
which is where BIOS, <coughs> BIOS the program is stored. CMOS RAM is where the configuration is stored in that RAM. And it's the CMOS battery that holds that information in. Okay, and every single computer uh, has some kind of uh, CMOS RAM battery. Does your iPhone have one? That's the battery. It never actually lets the battery go far enough dead. It'll shut down before it's dead because it holds enough power on there to keep your motherboard, the RAM in your mother on the motherboard of that little iPhone uh, holding that information in there. It doesn't have a separate one. It just never lets it go that dead. And if it does go that dead, it's all the stuff is written on ROM anyway, so it'll still come up and find the new date and time and all that good stuff. If, so if it was set left in storage for long enough to be dead, dead, dead. CMOS is like a power supply for the memory units of all the RAM. CMOS stands for something metal oxide system, and that term just goes with one of these. You, you have CMOS. It's motherboard. It'd be easier if you said motherboard RAM, motherboard ROM, motherboard battery, but it's, that's not what it's called. It's called the CMOS RAM, CMOS ROM, and the CMOS battery. I don't know why I didn't know about that term. So, so that's that's the whole the whole boot process in a nutshell. And and uh, we're gonna in chapter two we're gonna go and we're gonna boot up systems and see how to change the boot order and we're going to install operating systems in chapter two. Chapter two is the only software chapter in the whole book and then we just go on with hardware from then on out. Okay. You need to understand some of it to be able to diagnose stuff uh, but really it's not about how to, this isn't a Windows class, this is a hardware class but uh, we, we need to talk a little bit of, uh, enough about it for you to understand everything else that goes on from there. Questions about the boot order? A lot of stuff happens when I push the button. You need to order that they have to happen um, so that you understand where it failed. Okay, because if you don't, you might use it on here because it's not up to the moment. Hmm. Let me see. I'm going to boot it from the next thing and we'll see what happens. Does it shut down when I hit power? No, it doesn't. Well, this is sluggish run, running off the uh, flash drive. Oh, there we go. Considering how fast this system is, that is really, really slow. It runs better on those off the uh, solid state than it does off here on the flash drive. I would not want to do that. As a, okay, so what time is our class in? We still have 20 minutes left. Okay, good. So, um, what are we doing now? You guys are going to take this uh, PC boot mission basically is what we went over today on the boot process. Okay, it's you can take as many times as you want to. It's in your grade book in the in the uh, formative section, but you can only take it once every two hours. This is really a practice on using your notebook and seeing if your notes are good enough to pass tests. Okay, it's that's really what this this quiz is about to give you an example of what one of my tests is like and what would it be better for you to have in your notes to make sure you can pass the test. And obviously it's open note and all that good stuff too. Okay. If nobody has any questions, I'm just going to close the recording and let you guys close.